Hey guys, in this video I'm going to show you how to create your $100 million offer using the framework laid out in the book $100 Million Offers by Alex Hormozzi. So I recommend that you read the book, but in this video I'm going to condense it down to just the core process that you can follow step by step. So you may want to watch this a few times and I'll also make this worksheet available so you can follow along with that step by step as well. Now step one of creating your $100 million offer is to find a great market. Now, what do I mean when I say a great market? Well, <clears throat> a great market, according to Alex Hormozzi, has four characteristics. Number one, a massive pain, something that's that's a big problem that they're willing to pay to get rid of. So somebody who's very overweight, who has a health problem, somebody who uh, has a relationship problem, somebody who is in a job they hate, all of those things are massive pains that your product might be able to help them with. And the bigger the pain is, the more they're willing to pay to solve it. The next part is purchasing power. So somebody could have a massive pain, but if they're unable to pay you to solve it, then that's not really gonna work, right? So somebody that's homeless, that's living under a bridge, probably that's a big pain, and if you could help them, they'd be very grateful, but they don't have any money to pay you. So um, if you wanna do charity, then go for it, but if you want to actually get paid, then you gotta find people that actually have money. Next thing is easy to target, right? You have to be able to actually find these people. So if you're perfect, client is somebody that lives in a cabin in the woods and doesn't have internet and the only way to find them is to like go through the woods and knock on their door, then probably they're not a great market even if they have the other characteristics because it's hard to get to them in order to promote your product, in order to advertise. And then finally the last thing is growing, right? Now we're kind of looking ahead into the future. Like Tony Robbins always says, leaders anticipate, losers react, right? So you wanna anticipate where is the market going? Is it a market that's growing or and is going to get better and better or is it a market that's shrinking and it's just going to die on you? So an example of a great market that Alex gives is relationship coaching for older people. And so the reason is that it's a massive pain, right? Having a bad relationship really hurts the person's life. So they have, they're very motivated to solve the problem. Now, if they're older people, chances are they have some money saved up. They have the purchasing power. They're fairly easy to target, right? You could just target older people on, on YouTube with ads and say, hey, are you having XYZ problem in your relationship? If so, if so check out my thing. And growing. So yeah, there's more and more people having relationship problems as our society goes more and more down the toilet. I guess that's to be expected. Okay, now the next part to consider is your value equation what Alex calls the value equation. So what that means is that you want to um, increase your dream outcome, right? So if you can help people make more money, you wanna increase the amount of money that you can make. If you wanna help people lose weight, you increase the amount of weight that you can lose, etc. Whatever it is you offer for people, offer as much of it as possible. Next thing you wanna do is increase your perceived likelihood of success, right? So if the person's gonna join your weight loss program and there's only a 50-50 chance that it's gonna work, well, that's that hurts you, right? Whereas if they can be sure or they can be pretty close to sure that your program is gonna work for them, then they're much more likely to buy and they're gonna be willing to pay more for it, right? So the more you can increase their perception, their confidence in the likelihood of success of your program, the better it's gonna sell. Next part is decrease time delay, right? How long is it gonna take them for it to get the result? So this is kind of the difference between uh, going to the gym to lose weight versus getting liposuction. People spend a heck of a lot more on liposuction than they do on going to the gym. And part of that is because liposuction works quickly, right? You, you get the result really fast, whereas losing weight in the gym, it takes a while. So if you can decrease the time delay or the perceived time delay in order to get the benefit of your product, the more likely people are gonna to be to buy. And then finally, decrease the effort and sacrifice required to get the result. So along in that weight loss liposuction example, it's the same thing as the time delay, right? That it doesn't take a whole lot of, of effort and sacrifice to get liposuction. It does take a lot of effort and sacrifice to go to the gym and lose weight. So in whatever way that you can, decrease their perception of the effort and sacrifice it's going to take 
to get the result that you're promising through your method. Okay, so with that background, we're going to get into the core process, which is how to create your $100 million offer with these things in mind. First, so you have to have a great market, right? Or else, I mean, if you're selling to people that live under a bridge, nothing that we do here is gonna work. So it's necessary to talk about this first, make sure that you're in a good market. Um, and then the value equation is gonna drive everything that you do in your core process here. So the core process, the first step is to identify your dream outcome, or rather your audience's, your prospect's dream outcome. So that could be to lose 20 pounds in six weeks, you know, whatever it is that you're offering, whatever result you're offering, figure out what that is. And then the second part is to list the problems that your prospect is probably going to have in getting to that outcome. So for example, let's say that you offer weight loss. Well, some of the problems might be that uh, buying healthy food is expensive, buying healthy food is confusing, um, I don't know how to cook, I won't like the food, my, fa my friends and family won't support me, etc., etc. You want to list as many problems as you can that your prospect might have in getting to their desired result. Now, once you've listed your problems, you want to list solutions. So for every problem, what are the potential solutions? So let's take, for example, the problem of, I wanna eat healthy, but I don't know how to cook. Well, what are the possible solutions to that? Well, it could be that you learn how to cook. It could be that you find restaurants that have healthy food. It could be that you sign up for a meal service that sends you healthy food every week. Right? There's multiple solutions possible to the same problem, so go ahead and list out every solution that you can. Once you want to do that, you want to create solution delivery vehicles. So for every solution that you just came up with, think about specifically how could you provide that solution as a part of your product. So if the solution was learn to cook, right? Well, you could include a cooking course. You could include a cookbook. Maybe you could license somebody else's cooking course. Maybe you could provide links to cooking channels on YouTube. Or if the solution is eating healthy at restaurants, you could create a list of, of popular restaurants with menu items that follow the diet plan. Now you wanna come up with as many as you possibly can here. We're just brainstorming. Don't worry about how feasible it is. Don't worry if you're gonna be able to do it. Just any idea that comes to your head, write it down. And we're gonna trim this list down later on in the process here. And two helpful questions that Alex suggests for um, coming up with, with more of these is ask the question, what, what could I provide if I charged 10 times more, right? So. It helps you think outside the box. Like if I was charging 10 times my price, I had all this extra money to spend, what kind of solutions could I provide? And then once you come up with anything you can for that, ask this the opposite question. Uh, how could I still provide the same value if I charged one tenth the price? Right, so how could I still get people the same result even if I didn't have very much money to spend? I didn't have very much money to work with in delivering. Now again, this is not telling you that you should change your price. This is just saying, just helping you expand your mind a little bit and think about what are the possibilities. And then finally, the last step is to trim and stack. So what you're gonna do is go through all of those delivery vehicles that you just created, and you're gonna rate them on two criteria. The first criteria is by cost, right? So for each one, just you can just rate it by low cost or high cost. So you can just write an LC or an HC beside each one, depending on if it's low cost or high cost to provide. And when we talk about low cost versus high cost, we're talking per unit here. So for example, if uh, let's say you provide a, a cooking course or you, you link to a cooking course, right? Well then that would be low cost. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything to do that. Um, or if you like create some cooking videos yourself, it might take you a little bit of cost, a little bit of effort up front to create the things, but 
after it's created, it takes basically no cost and no effort to continue offering them. So we're talking per unit here, per additional sale, is it low cost or high cost? Now, something like a subscription service where they deliver you food in the mail, that would be high cost. Right, because for every additional person, you have to, you know, you have to pay for them to get their meals. What might work better is you just give them a, a links to some delivery services, right? Because that way it would be no cost to you at all. In fact, you could even get affiliate commissions from it if you wanted to. So go through all of those and rate them based on high cost or low cost. And then the second criteria is value. You wanna rate them based on low value or high value. So how interested do you think your prospects would be in this particular solution, right? Does, would they, would it like really make their eyes pop and think, oh, that's amazing. Or they just think, eh, it's okay, right? So rate them based on, you know, your, your subjective notions whether it's LV, low value, or HV, high value. And so when you've gone through and you've rated everything by cost and by value, then you wanna go and, and go through and keep everything that's high or low cost, high value, right? So if it's low cost for you to provide and it's high value for the customer, then it's a win-win and you definitely wanna keep that. Now for something that's that's low value anything low value you want to just get rid of right it's just not worth cluttering up your your sales copy with anything that's not going to be really um really valuable to the person uh, and then something you might have some things that are high cost and high value and so for those it's kind of a matter of is it worth it and so you just ask yourself that question is it worth it and then uh, the corollary question is there a low cost substitute that I could use to get the same result for the person, but would be a lower cost to me. And if you can find something, then great, then you can cross out the high cost one. If you can't, then maybe it's worth it to provide the high cost thing, especially if you're offering a, a high ticket program of some sort, and you can actually afford to put a, a one or two high cost things in there. Now, once you've got the components of your offer listed out, and by the way, the components can be added, you can, you can divide them between your core program and your bonuses, right? So the, you can, beside each component, you can add it as a bonus. And I like to do this if it specifically meets a certain objection. So people hear my offer and they think, oh, well, I don't know how to cook, so this isn't gonna work for me. So it's really easy to say bonus, how, thing to, to learn how to cook or a thing to give you a restaurant delivery service or whatever. But anyway, that's the uh, the core offer. Now, the next part we wanna talk about is scarcity, right? You wanna give people a reason to act now because if people see a great offer but they think it's gonna be available forever or they think that there's infinite amount of it, then they're, they're probably not gonna take action and they're not gonna value it as much. So. There's basically three ways, according to the book, to create scarcity. So you could have limited number of spots, right? So if you have a, a live event or something, you can have, uh, there's only 100 spots and after that it's sold out. Or if it's a, a item that you're selling, you can only have a certain amount of that item in, in stock. If you have a service-based business, like you run a marketing agency or something, you could say, well, I only, I only have space for three more clients before I'm maxed out. So you could limit the number of spots, you could limit uh, number of bonuses. So you could say, okay, um, there's unlimited number of spots, but if you wanna get XYZ bonus, then there's only five of those available. And this is good for something that's a little more on the high effort side. So for example, if you sell an online course, but then you offer to do like a one-on-one -on -one session with them as a bonus, well, you could say the first 10 people that buy the course will also get this one-on-one -on -one session. And it, it makes sense. It's not like fake scarcity. It's, it's your time, so it makes sense that you will limit the number. And then finally, the last uh, scarcity is never available again, right? So you have to buy it now or it's never gonna be available again. If it's, it's like something that's a live event, you know, I'm doing this live event this weekend and if you miss it, you miss it because it's a one-time thing. Now, next thing you want that goes alongside scarcity is urgency, right? You want people to have a reason to buy the thing now. And so some of it comes with scarcity, right? Because if there's a limited number of, of bonuses, let's say, and the first 10 people get the bonus, well, they kind of have to act now or else they're gonna maybe 
miss out on the bonus, but there's also things you can do for urgency. So you can do, the first way is, is cohort-based. So what cohort-based means is that you have a group of people that are starting next Thursday, and if you miss it, then you have to wait until three months from now. So if you're delivering your product or your service based on cohorts, then you can do that. You can have what he calls rolling seasonal urgency. So this means you can create a special. So you can say, um, I'm doing a spring special and anybody who gets in, gets in by May 15th gets this bonus or gets this discount, right? And then you can keep doing that. So you can have a spring special and then you can have a fall special and a winter special or you could do it monthly or however you want to di divide it up. But make sure that each one is unique and that it makes sense. Next thing you could do is pricing or bonus based urgency. So you can do pricing promotions, you can do discounts, you can add bonuses, you can say for this month only we're adding XYZ bonus, or for this month only we're cutting the price by 10%, or you could just tell people when you're gonna raise your price. This works really, really well in my experience with my own businesses. If I say, hey, at the end of the, the month, I'm gonna raise my price by an extra $2,000, get in now or uh, you know if you want to get get grandfathered in at the old price right so that that really gets people um, off their butts and to take action and then the last urgency is exploding opportunity so what this means is that the opportunity that you're offering is going to go away so something for like he uses the 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 example of cryptocurrency if you tell people that there's this amazing opportunity to buy a cryptocurrency before it pops off um, then just the fact that of the timing itself with the opportunity means that they have to get in now because if they get in a month from now, they will have already missed the opportunity and you can communicate that to them. And then the last part of this that I wanna go over is guarantees, right? Guarantees, so basically risk reversal. You wanna remember the, the driver's value we talked about before, you want to increase the perceived likelihood of success. So you want to give people a, a hedge against the risk because when they come in, they're not 100% sure that your thing is going to work for them. And so if you give them a guarantee that reverses their risk, oftentimes that will make them much more likely to buy. So there are four types of guarantees that Alex goes over in the book. The first is an unconditional guarantee. So just like if the person doesn't like it, then they can get their money back. So this is something you might want to do with lower ticket offers. So if you have a course that costs $9.97, you say, I'm so confident that you're going to love this course that if you don't like it for any reason, if it doesn't suit your interests, uh, then you can just let me know and I will refund you in full, no questions asked. Next type of guarantee is a conditional guarantee. This is something that I use fairly often. Um, I'll say something like, okay, so I'm so confident that my process works that if you follow my process and you don't get the desired result, then I will refund you in full. And maybe I'll, I'll even go above that and I'll, and I'll refund you in full and I'll give you a $100 gift card to the restaurant of your choice uh, just to say sorry for wasting your time. Right, so what I'm doing here is I'm making it conditional. I'm saying you have to go through the process. If you go through the process and it doesn't work, then I will um, give you your money back. And this is important because a lot of times people will sign up for something, they'll get all excited, they'll, they'll do it for a couple of weeks and then they'll say, oh, this is too much work, I don't wanna do it. Or they'll, they'll get distracted by some other shiny object and um, they'll say, oh, well, I, I want my money back because I never went through your course. And so, you know, the unconditional guarantee is a little bit more attractive, but it also means that you get a bunch of people that just just gave up or whatever, and, and then they want you to pay them back for it. Whereas a conditional guarantee, you say, okay, well, you have to prove that you actually did the things that I told you to do, and it didn't work in order for you to get the, the money back. And then you can have what he calls an anti-guarantee, which is basically you just tell the person that you do not offer any kind of money back guarantee and you give them a reason why. So for example, if I show you my process, if you buy my product and I show you exactly all of my, the inner workings of my business, then 
you have that information forever. I can never take that back. And because of that, I don't offer a guarantee. Or you can say something like, I'm looking for people who are going to push forward and go through the difficulties and, and realize that it might not work the first time and you have to keep on going. I, I need people that have that dedication, that commitment, that faith, that they're gonna keep working on it and tweaking until they get the result. So if you're thinking about this and saying, oh, well, you know, you're, you're already hedging your bets and, and wondering about what what happens if it doesn't work, well, then you've already lost, and I'd rather you just not sign up in the first place, right? That's an anti-guarantee. So you're, you're explicitly saying that you're not offering a guarantee, and in doing so, you're actually kind of um, giving yourself more credibility because you have a good reason, a reason that makes sense and is positioned in their best interest. And then finally is an implied guarantee. What that means is that you have a um, performance-based offer. So it could be that you don't pay until I get you XYZ result. Or it could be that I'll build you this funnel for your business and you'll give me 10% of the profits that come out of the funnel. And it's implied because if they don't get any results, then obviously they don't have to pay you. You're not calling it a guarantee, but it essentially acts as a guarantee. And you, can, you don't have to just choose one of these types of guarantees, you can actually stack guarantees. So you can add multiple guarantees. Um, so for example, you could have a, uh, you pay part of it up front and part of it is based on, is an implied guarantee. So you, you like revenue share. So I, I get an upfront payment and then you pay me 10% of profit. So there's that implied guarantee. I'm showing that I'm interested in your success because I get paid when you get paid. Um, and then you could have a like a conditional guarantee for the first part. So, you know, if it doesn't work, then I will give you your money back, right? That would be two different guarantees. Now, those are the main types of guarantees. There are also a bunch of other ones that he lists, like a service guarantee where, you know, you get your result or else I keep working with you until you do. A bunch of other ones, too, that are kind of minor that I'm not going to go over here, but read the book if you want to see those. And then to find the best guarantee, the one that's going to work the best, think about what is your customer most afraid of, right? What do they most want to not happen if they pay you? And so, you know, it could be that they're afraid of losing out on the money. It could be that they're most afraid of wasting their time. It could be they're afraid of, of looking like an idiot in front of their friends. Figure out what is the biggest thing that would that would um, people are worried about if they buy from you and it doesn't go the way that they want. And then choose the guarantee that mitigates that, right? So if they're most worried about the money, then give a money back guarantee, right? Or if they're most worried about the time, you can give them a money back guarantee plus some extra to compensate them for the time that they lost. If they're most worried that, that they're too slow and it's gonna be hard for them to get done within the time frame provided, then it might be a service-based guarantee that I'll continue working with you until you get the result. So that's it, that's the whole process. I'll put a link to this worksheet somewhere if you're interested in the worksheet. And if you like this video, I'd recommend you also check out this video where I show you the biggest, most impactful lessons that made me a lot of money that I learned from the book Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson.